Praise the Lord. That was awesome. You know, the Lord laid some things on my heart specifically for this meeting a few weeks ago. And uh, that doesn't happen to me all of the time. And usually it's because if he shows me in advance, there's something that's going to happen that would get me off track. I don't know if that makes sense to you, but I usually just get up and God just gives it to me at the last moment. But uh, primarily it's to keep me from getting sidetracked by something. And uh, after the decision last Friday by the Supreme Court, I think I know why he gave it to me because <laughs> I'd be preaching on that if I was, if he didn't. So let me just mention that I did write a response about the Supreme Court's decision and we have that available on the welcome uh, desk out there and uh, you're welcome to take that. Uh, the only thing I would say about this, and it's gonna be very brief in the name of Jesus is that as much as I hated what was uh, done by the Supreme Court, it has really grieved me to have some of my close friends who are ministers celebrate this and come out and just lambast anybody who believes in the Bible standard of morality. And they do it because they say they're walking in love. And yet they are so mean towards anybody who believes what the Bible says <laughs> that it's, you know, it's really hypocritical. So anyway, I'm just saying that don't, don't let someone mislead you by saying that we need to walk in love. We just need to love people. It's love to tell people the truth. Let me give you this one illustration and then I shall get with what God told me to do. <laughs> but you know, I was driving up the uh, pass here uh, one time, this has been many years ago, and it was a dark night, it was rainy, and it was fog. The fog was so thick, I couldn't see any further than from here to the front row. And a car just passed me going 60 miles an hour up this pass, and within just a few feet, they hit something, their brakes came on, and the car just swerved over to the right. And so I had to swerve, and I stopped, and I was right beside this car, and there was a horse that was standing in the road, and they hit this horse. And so it caved in the windshield and this person was laying there bleeding and they were in bad shape. And this horse was laying, they were in the right hand lane. I was on the shoulder and in the left lane, there was a horse laying there that uh, had been injured. And while I was sitting there trying to, you know, uh, process all of this about what do I do? A Suburban came around the corner about 55 or 60 miles an hour and it hit that horse and it just launched this Suburban in the air, uh, I don't know, maybe five or 10 feet high and maybe 20 or 30 feet and that Suburban hit and the lady was able to control it. I went running up there and she had knocked a hole through the roof with her head and she was in bad shape. And so there was just cars coming all of the time. So you know what I did? I, I went back down the road and started jumping out in front of cars. And I mean, they were going 55 and 60 and you could only see 10 or 15 feet. And so I was jumping out in front of these cars and I mean, I was having to jump off of the road to keep from getting hit. People were screaming to a stop. I had people pull over on the side of the road and cuss me out and wave at me with one finger <laughs> and just do all kinds of terrible things. And I mean, they were ready to fight me. And yet when they got around the corner and saw that there was wrecks blocking all of the road, did you know what? I'm sure they understood that I was trying to save their life. And they didn't like what I did and it would have been easier on me to not do it. But there's a scripture in uh, Leviticus 19, 17 that says, you shall not hate your neighbor in your heart, but you, sh or you shall not hate, how's it go? thy brother in thine heart, but thou shalt in any wise rebuke thy neighbor and not suffer sin upon him. If you truly love a person, you're going to tell them that they're doing something that's destructive. That doesn't mean that you're mean to them. That doesn't mean that you hate them. And, and the thing that I has really got under my skin is that somehow or another, if you say that homosexuality is wrong or that adultery or anything is wrong, you are a hate monger. It's just the opposite. It'd be a lot easier for me to keep my mouth shut. 
But I'm telling you, if you truly love people, you ought to say something. That doesn't mean that you go up and attack them. Anyway, I could preach on that. I'm not going to do it. But I just am saying that, praise God, we, we need to operate in biblical love. Not what this world is calling love that just allows people to do things that you know are going to destroy their life. I tell you, that's not love to let a person do that. So anyway, that's all I'm going to say. What I'm going to minister on, what God laid on my heart, and I'm going to be ministering on this all week long. And, you know, I heard uh, Arthur Minis uh, Minister, I started to say his last name, and I never can pronounce that. But I heard Arthur Minister yesterday on some things that go right along with this. I told him it was kind of like a confirmation, and I'm going to take what he said and fix it and preach it right. <laughs> And then Charlie and Jill sang some songs that were just perfect. Like every day I come to you and lift my voice to honor you. And my favorite place to be is to worship at your feet. And what God laid on my heart to really speak on is just dwelling in God's presence. Not visiting there. Not going there for a devotion once a day. But learning how to dwell in the presence of God. And there is a lot more to say about that than what I'm going to be able to get said this week. I know somebody might think, well, that's pretty simple. Well, if it's so simple, why don't we do it? I'm going to share some things that I believe that this will challenge you. And let me just start by saying that I don't profess that I've got this all figured out and that I do it perfectly. I'm kind of like Paul talked about that this you know, one thing I do, forgetting the things that are behind, I press on. He says, I haven't apprehended, but this one thing I do. And this is something that God, just immediately, when I had my miraculous encounter with the Lord in 1968, I don't know, nobody told me this, but I intuitively, after tasting and seeing that God was good, I knew that nothing else compared with God, nothing else drew my attention. And I mean, I have just been obsessed with seeking God with my whole heart, putting him first and foremost and not doing it in spurts, but trying to do it consistently. Again, I haven't obtained unto it, but that's my goal. And it's what I'm working on. And I really consider it to be one of the main things that God has done in my life. And I want to share with you that a lot of the promises of God, probably more than what we realize, are really conditional upon us dwelling in the presence of God. That's significant. The word dwell means to, uh, this is your habitation. This is where you stay. It's denoting a fixed position is what the word literally means. And sad to say, I think that most Christians come and go and they are, are sometimes with the Lord and other times they aren't with the Lord. Here's some of the things, I'll go into more detail on this, but you know, we have a culture today in the church that teaches that we're supposed to have devotion times and we're supposed to get in these intense times of prayer. And there's nothing wrong with that. I'm not against devotions. All right, you heard me say this. So don't misunderstand what I'm saying. I am not against devotions. I'm not against doing those things, but I'm saying that that is still far short of dwelling in the presence of God. It's better than not having a devotion. It's better than not seeking the Lord and not putting your mind on the Lord. I'm not against them. It's a step in the right direction. But so much of what the word talks about, Jesus talked about abiding in me. It talks about in Isaiah 26, 3, the Lord will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed upon him. That word stayed means to grab hold. You don't let go. You got a death grip on it. And the average person visits the Lord. They, they go in spurts. They may have a devotion and then the rest of the day they go out and they're just as mean as a snake. You know, I believe that honestly, and I'm not again saying that I do this perfectly, but I can tell you that my time of walking on my trail, driving in a car, doing anything that I'm doing, there is no difference between that and when I am shut up and studying and doing something specifically that's called a religious devotion. I believe that we need to get to the place to where, praise God, we live in the presence of God. We dwell in the presence of God. And that is not true with most people. 
Again, I commend you for coming here this week and taking the time. Who knows how much effort. These people that came from Ghana and different places, it's a, it's a lot of expense. It's a lot of effort. I talked about one person that took the bus here, I think, from West Virginia. And they started last Thursday taking the bus. You know, it's a lot of effort. I commend you for it. And this is great, but you need to get to where when you're at home and you're with the Lord and there's nothing special going on, that you are just as much in the presence of God and you're enjoying the presence of God just as much. And this isn't something that is unattainable. Ashley talked about it tonight, that little teaching on how to, the four keys to staying full of God. You can choose how full of God you want to be. You can choose how happy you are. You can choose how anointed you are. You can choose how blessed you are because God has already blessed us with all of these things. God has already done his part and it's up to us. And one of the keys is learning how to dwell in God's presence and not just visit there or vacation there. And as much as I commend you for doing this, if you come here and get your mind stayed on the Lord and receive something from God, but then you go back and plug yourself into a lifestyle to where your mind isn't stayed on God, you are not gonna have perfect peace. If you don't abide in the Lord, you will not have the results that uh, John chapter 15 talks about. And let me turn over here to uh, Psalms chapter 91 and just start with this and, and give you some examples out of Psalms 91 about this. Psalms chapter 91, it says in the very first verse, he that dwelleth in the secret place of the most high shall abide under the shadow of the almighty. And we're gonna go on and read the rest of these verses, but there are some powerful promises here. I don't believe there's a person in this auditorium that doesn't want all of the benefits that Psalms 91 talks about. It's awesome. If every one of us was living up to the full potential of what God had promised us right here, I guarantee you there would be no lack. There would be no inadequacy, not only in your life, but in other people's lives. You would be stronger than horseradish and you would be blessing people and awesome things would be happening. That is not the experience of everyone. And I can tell you uh, the largest reason is because this starts with that all of these promises and blessings that are spoken are to those who dwell in the secret place of the most high. Again, this word dwell is denoting a fixed position, not something that occurs sporadically. It is a fixed position. That's a major statement. Look over here, keep your finger, I'm coming back to this, but look in Psalms chapter 31. This secret place that this is talking about, in Psalms chapter 31 and in verse 20 it says, Thou shalt hide them. This is talking about those who put their trust in the Lord and are seeking him. It says, thou shalt hide them in the secret of thy presence from the pride of man. Thou shalt keep them secretly in a pavilion from the strife of tongues. So this is talking about a secret place of God's presence. And I believe that this is what Psalms 91 is talking about when it says, he that dwelleth in the secret place of the most high. This is talking about those that just dwell in the presence of God. Now I'm going to deal with this more and try and drive this point home, but let me just say this. I think most people mentally agree with this, that God never leaves us nor forsakes us. He's with us constantly. God never leaves, but we aren't aware of that. And it says in Philemon chapter one, verse six, it says the communication of your faith becomes effectual by the acknowledging of every good thing that is in you in Christ Jesus. Even though the Lord never leaves us nor forsakes us, even though the Lord, there is nowhere that you can flee from his presence. It's impossible to get away from God. God is with you constantly. It doesn't benefit you unless you believe that. And unless you practice being in the presence of God and you constantly are aware of his presence and his favor. I'm also going to be talking about a lot of things. A lot of people are, they have a God consciousness, but it's not the true God. It. It's a religious concept where there's wrath and punishment and they feel guilt and punishment. And they, instead of that blessing you and keeping you in the secret place of the most high, 
It'll keep you with the mindset that, oh yeah, God exists, but he wouldn't do anything for me. So I'm going to be talking about that. But I'm just trying to drive home this point that all of these promises that are given and really everything in the word of God, God is faithful to us, but we have to be conscious of it. We have to renew our mind and we have to be aware of these things. And it's not a matter of God's faithfulness. It's a matter of our faithfulness to this. Now, again, we don't do it perfectly. And I'm also going to say, I'm giving you a little introduction to all of this. And I'm also going to say these things that if we haven't been seeking the Lord, if we haven't dwelt in the presence of the Lord, the way that we should, God's not mad at us and you don't have to grovel on your face and come to him and it says that he remembers our frame. He knows that we are but dust and God is merciful and he's willing and able to receive you. So you don't have to beat yourself up over this. But at the same time, we need to intentionally get to where we are aware of God's presence and get rid of this concept that, you know, when you come together like this in a, in a group, that there's something special. Well, there may be a special manifestation. You might see more because you've got people here in agreement and God said where two or three are gathered together in my name, there am I in the midst. You might see a greater manifestation and stuff, but God is with you the same at all times. I don't care the worst moment you've ever had. God was as close to you as, he, as he's been to you at your best moment. It's not God that changed, it's your perception and awareness that changes. And I'm saying that your awareness of God's presence with you is something that is completely at your control. You can make yourself to where you dwell in the presence of the Most High constantly and you're aware of it and you're aware of His goodness and you never, ever, ever feel forsaken. Thank you for that one, that's it. Arthur's in agreement with me. I know some of you think, well, that's pretty simple. I agree with that. Well, probably not. I have people come to me all the time. That, well, I just don't feel the love of God. And they immediately want me to pray and ask God to give them a feeling. And they don't believe that God is with them until they feel it. And I've actually had people debate this and get mad at me. Because they will say, well, it doesn't matter what the Bible says, that God's with me all the time. If I don't feel it, well, then it's not real to me. I've had people say that. I've had people criticize me and stuff and say, it doesn't matter what the Bible says. You've got to feel it. And if you don't feel it, well, then it's not real. Boy, that is, that just irks me. <laughs> I'm trying to be nice. But what that does, that establishes your feelings as God. More important than the word of God, more important than the truth. Who cares what the truth is? This is what you feel. You know, over in Ephesians chapter four, verses 17 and 18, those are powerful verses. And in verse 18 or 19 right there, it says that they being beyond feeling have given themselves over unto lasciviousness. You know what that's talking about is that there is a right use for feelings. God gave us the capacity for feelings. Feelings aren't from the devil. God, if, if we didn't have any feelings, did you know that life would be really, really bland? Some people would like it because maybe you wouldn't feel the hurt and the pain, but I can guarantee you, you'd miss out on all of the good things, the awesome feelings. Feelings, God gave us feelings to enjoy, but there is a right and a wrong use of them. And what that's talking about in Ephesians chapter four, it says they've gone beyond feelings. They've gone beyond the natural use of feelings and have given themselves over to lasciviousness. Lasciviousness is talking about unrestrained, uncontrolled, undisciplined feelings. In other words, just feelings are the reality. If you feel it, then it's real and if you don't feel it, it's not real. That is lasciviousness. That is going beyond the natural use of it. And there are people that it doesn't matter what the word says about being with them and that God will never forsake you. He's with you always, etc. It's just, I just don't feel it. And so they come to me and say, would you please pray with me that God would just 
you know, they won't say it this way, but that he would give me a feeling. No, I won't. You need to pull your thumb out of your mouth, grow up and get to where you start standing on what the word of God says. And if you'll do it, your feelings will follow. If your feelings are constantly way over here and yet you're professing that God's never left me. He's always with me. I'm blessed. I have joy. And well, and if it's always that way, something's wrong. And you need to fix it, but it's not God that's wrong. It's not God that isn't giving you the feelings. It's something in you. You know, most of us don't like the emotion of pain and uh, the feeling of pain. But you know what? God gave us the ability to feel pain for our own good. So that if you lay your hand on a hot stove, <laughs> you know, we have a wood burner at our house. And um, every once in a while, I'll touch that stove. And before I even have time to think about it, man, I jerk back. And stuff. If I didn't have that feeling that caused me to react and to do something, I could burn my hand. I could be, uh, I could burn my nerves. I could get to where I couldn't even use my hand and do different things. It's not a pleasant feeling, but it serves a purpose. And you know, the feeling of sorrow and grief and depression and lots of other things, they aren't pleasant feelings, but they do serve a purpose. They show us something, something's out of whack and something needs to get fixed. But uh, if you are constantly just ignoring them, well, then you are ignoring a problem. Something needs to be fixed and dealt with. But there is a right and a wrong use of that feeling. And I'm saying most of us have gone way beyond it. I'm saying that you can keep your mind stayed on the Lord, Isaiah 26, 3, and you'll be in perfect peace. And if you aren't in perfect peace, it's because your mind is not stayed on the Lord. Not because God needs to do something and touch you and give you a new deal. It's because you need to renew your mind and you need to learn some things. Amen. So that's a long introduction. But in Psalms chapter 91, he that dwells in the secret place of the most high, talking about his presence, shall abide under the shadow of the almighty. This word shadow, it's in... Uh, Numbers chapter 14, verse nine, this exact same Hebrew word is translated defense. When the, um, Joshua and Caleb said that about the giants, it says, don't worry about them. Their defense is departed from them. That's the exact same word that was translated shadow here. So this is what it's talking about. That when you dwell, when you don't visit there, when you don't just cry out to God when you're in trouble and then when everything's okay, you go on your way until the next time you're in need. But when you dwell in the presence of God, constantly you abide under the defense, under the protection, under the shadow of the almighty. But it's a conditional promise. Amen. I'm preaching better than you're listening. <laughs> and look at this in verse two, it says, I will say of the Lord, he is my refuge and my fortress, my God in him will I trust. Here's another thing to say about this, that these promises of God are voice activated. You have to say of the Lord. And there's a lot of people, well, I would never say that. <laughs> I would never say that God's always going to bless me. I would never say that, praise God, I always triumph in our Lord Jesus Christ. There's a lot of people that just believe that this is arrogant or something like that. I tell you, it takes humility to sit there and face life with all of its problems and all of its opposition and stuff and still have a positive confession and to say that God is on my side and that I'm going to win and praise God, I'm going to come out smelling like a rose. Things like that take humility and faith. It's not arrogance and it, you have to say it. There's a lot of people that won't say this. There's a lot of people that won't say that God heals all of our sicknesses and all of our diseases. They might say God heals, but they won't be bold and speak it forth because of experiences, because of problems, because they have seen people that haven't received their healing or whatever and stuff. And because of it, there's people that won't speak forth what God's word says. The promises of God are voice activated. You have to say of the Lord, he is my refuge and my fortress, my God in him will I trust. Surely he shall deliver thee from the snare of the fowler and from the noisome pestilence. Again, this is expressing faith and confidence. You got to say, surely 
He's going to deliver me. Praise God, I'll come through this. You know, I am not preaching here that you'll never have a problem. Amen. It's amazing how you have to spend so much time explaining yourself. There's nothing wrong with what I'm saying. But there's people that will sit there and say, so you're saying that you'll never have a problem. Give me a break. Jamie and I have had more problems than most of you. And we've had a lot of opposition. You know, just anyway, I'm not going to tell you about all this, but this building over here, it takes a lot of money to build this building. And I've been having to have meetings today. And in the natural, we hadn't got the money to do this. And I'm having to sit here and deal with what's going to happen if we don't get some more money coming in and stuff. I've got problems. And I'm not saying that everything works perfectly. You know, and, and if we had to slow down or stop construction over here, some people, well, you failed. Well, I, well, it's not perfect. I believe that if Jesus was here and if this was what God told him to do, he'd get it done without a hitch. Amen. But I've never done anything perfectly in my life. And if I had to slow down for a month, if it cost me an extra two, three months or six months or whatever to get things finished, I'm still going to finish. it. I am sure. I am sure that we're going to finish it. We will get things done. But that doesn't mean that we won't have any opposition. It doesn't mean that I don't have any tests. It doesn't mean that every once in a while I'm not under pressure and stuff like that. People who interpret what I'm saying, that you just never have any pressure. Well, I, I don't even have the time to explain that any further. That's just it. Anyway, surely he shall deliver thee from the snare of the fowler and from the noisome pestilence. Did you know noisome pestilence here? I've looked this up in the Greek and I mean in the Hebrew and stuff and it's talking about plagues. You know, today I heard on the news that they just found the plague in a deer that's down in Pleasant Valley, which I drive through there every time I go to our Colorado Springs office and they had a boy die in, was it Colorado Springs? Or anyway, it was in Colorado of the plague last week. And so they're now talking about the plague. And I'm not saying that you sit there and go up to dead animals and just uh, do stuff stupid and expose yourself to things. But you know what? I'm not afraid of the plague because surely he's going to deliver me <laughs> from the snare of the devil and from the noisome pestilence, a plague. Surely he's going to do it. You don't have to be afraid of that. You know, I've prayed for people with AIDS before and they've coughed and spit in my face which is how you transmit stuff like that. And you know what? I've never gotten it. I'm never going to get it because no plague is going to come nigh my dwelling. We'll read that in a moment. But you have to believe it and you have to dwell in the presence of the Almighty and you have to camp there and stay there. You have to grab hold of it. If all you're doing is visiting the presence of the Lord on Sunday and then the rest of the week, you're just totally on your own and you're carnal and you do whatever you want to. Well, then you better go get some shots and take all the precautions you can get. Because every one of these promises are talking about you dwelling in the presence of the Almighty. It says in verse 4, he shall cover thee with his feathers and under his wings shalt thou trust. His truth shall be thy shield and buckler. You know, this is describing the way that a hen uh, protects its chicks. It puts its wings out and protects them from rain and from hail. And from things like that, this is what this is describing, that God will give his angels charge over you. We'll mention that in just a minute. He will protect you. But if a chick runs out from under the wings of its mother and gets wet, don't blame the mother hen. The protection was there, but you've got to dwell. You've got to stay under the shadow. And, you know, this is what I would say about... Uh, you know, there's going to be a lot of Christians, especially the evangelicals that will sit there and say because of the decision of the Supreme Court that God's wrath is coming on this nation and he's going to judge this nation and destroy it. I tell you what, if God didn't judge this nation for slavery and for other things, and if he didn't destroy us, if we survived that and if we've been through a lot of the other stuff, God's not going to judge us over homosexuality. Does that mean that God is approving of it? No. It's wrong, but God placed our judgment upon Jesus and he has promised protection and God has protected this nation supernaturally, amen. But again, there's people that if you take that stance, they'll say, so you just believe that it's okay. No, we are going out from under the wings of the almighty. 
It, we aren't trusting in his truth. It's not our shield and buckler. We are leaning to our own way. And I guarantee if America continues to endorse what God hates and promotes it and gets to where the only people that it's politically correct to attack are Bible believing Christians. It's not God that's going to destroy us. It's us that are destroying ourselves. We've got the devil out there going about seeking whom he may devour. And he'll destroy this nation if this nation just consistently continues to walk away from God. It's like this illustration right here. That he's covered us, but he's covered us when we are standing on the word of God. When we are abiding in his presence. When we are dwelling in him. But you start walking out from under that. There's consequences to sin. There's consequences to walking away from God. There's consequences to saying, God, we don't want you in our school. We don't want prayer. We don't want these things. We don't want you. We want a secular society. You keep saying that God's not going to judge us, but you just keep walking out from under his protection. And I guarantee you there's more than enough uh, people out there that hate this nation are doing everything they can to destroy it. And we will implode. Amen. Amen. So this is important. He'll cover us with his feathers and under his wings shalt thou trust. But if you walk out from under there and if you get judgment, if America begins to start seeing things happen, I personally believe that this is the 9-11 attacks. That wasn't a judgment of God. What that is, that's the results of us kicking God out and walking away from him. This is what happens when you take God away and say, God, we don't want you. And so he'll just stay right there. And all of his protection are still there in the secret place of the most high. And for those who are trusting from him, it's not God that judged us. If God was judging America on 9-11, he wouldn't have stopped with the Twin Towers or the Pentagon. And if he wouldn't have stopped with Hurricane Katrina, I guarantee you, he'd have marched right across the country. When God's judgment falls in the book of Revelation, you'll know it. Nobody's going to have to be telling you what's going on. That wasn't the judgment of God. That's the results of us turning away and, become, and, and loosing these forces. I could preach on that, but in the name of Jesus, I'm not going to. In verse 5, it says, Thou shalt not be afraid for the terror by night, nor for the arrow that flieth by day, nor for the pestilence that walketh in darkness, nor for the destruction that wasteth at noonday. How many Christians fear? They fear cancer. They fear sickness. They fear plagues. They'll come out and say that it's flu season and this is a new strain of flu. And you know what? Sadly, most Christians will get in fear exactly the same as non-Christians. There was Christians when the, uh, you know, quote unquote, great recession happened in 2008, early 2009. Christians panicked. Christians expected the end, destruction, the same as non-Christians. How do you harmonize that with you will not be afraid for the terror by night, nor for the arrow that flieth by day, nor for the pestilence that walketh in darkness, nor for the destruction that wasteth at noonday. Most people's experience is contrary to this. And you know why? Because they don't dwell in the presence of the Almighty. Because they aren't constantly living there. They go there on occasions. But there are so many attitudes. There are so many values. There are so many things contrary to what God's word says. And we just live large portions of our life thinking and living, watching things, reading things, listening to things, participating in things that are completely contrary to everything that God stands for. And then we wonder why these things aren't working for us. Amen or oh me. It says in verse seven, a thousand shall fall at thy side and 10,000 at thy right hand, but it shall not come nigh thee. Again, most Christians are influenced by what the Bible says, but they are controlled by what's basically going on in the culture. And they look at other Christians and if other Christians are struggling and doing this and this and this, well, then they'll just sit there and say, well, you know, that must be the way that it is. And yet this talks about a thousand falling right at your side at 10,000 at your right hand, but it shall not come nigh thee. That means that your experience 
can be completely contrary to what everybody else in the world is going through if you would stand on these scriptures and dwell there. Most Christians won't stand that way, but that's exactly what this verse is saying. You know, I heard a uh, testimony about the plague in the middle age, mid ages, and it was just sweeping through Europe. And I forgot the statistics, I've heard them, but percentage wise to the population of the world at that time, there were more people that died from the plague during the middle ages than any other thing that has ever happened in the history of the world. There were places where I mean nearly 100% of the people were wiped out. There were millions and millions and millions of people destroyed by it. And there was just basically no remedy for it. And I heard a story about a man who was a pastor. I think it was in England. I'm not certain of this, but it was in somewhere in the European area. And the plague was just sweeping through. And he took this scripture and went out and stood on the, on the um, boundary of his village and quoted this and stood there and commanded it and defied those powers and said, no plague will come nigh this dwelling. And there wasn't one person in his entire village that got the plague while other villages were wiped out 100%. And to even state that that's a possibility. Some people will say, so you're condemning everybody else. I'm not condemning you. God loves you. You can die of the plague if you want to. <laughs> that doesn't mean you go to hell, but I'm saying that God has granted us protection and power and blessing when you dwell under the presence of the almighty God that I guarantee you, you can see different results in what everybody else is getting. I have people come up to me all the time and they say things like, but you're sitting, well, you're sitting here saying that I, I could be uh, living at a higher level. I could be experiencing greater victory and stuff like that. That condemns me. I'm not trying to condemn anybody, but as long as you just keep lowering the bar so that if somebody is struggling, say, Hey, don't worry about it. It's okay. God wants you to suffer. God wants you to be sick. God doesn't want everybody here. And you just keep lowering the bar so that nobody will ever feel like that they could be doing better. Well, then they're never going to do any better. I'm not condemning anybody. I'm not mad at you. You can leave here and go out and live an absolutely defeated life. You can be poor. You can be sick. You can be miserable. You can go up and down like a yo-yo and have mountaintop experiences, then go down into the valley and spend time there and blame God for that and say that you're growing in the valley. You're free to do that. And I love you. Go ahead. But I'm telling you the truth. You do not have to be up and down like a yo-yo. You can be consistent in the presence of the Lord. There is fullness of joy at his right hand. There are pleasures forevermore. Psalms chapter 16, verse 11. And I'm telling you, if you are in the presence of the Lord, there would be fullness of joy. Again, this doesn't mean that there's not a problem. It doesn't mean that things don't happen. I had some things happen to me today. Some of my friends that I was telling you about that I just heard terrible things. And man, it broke my heart. I've had a tough day. <laughs> Amen. But you know what? I am not defeated and depressed and discouraged. And I'm going to keep loving people and loving God. And I'm over it. And God helps me to... Go on, but I'm saying I have things happen to me. I'm not condemning anybody, but I'm, I'm not going to live there. Amen. I'm going to overcome it. No government died for me. They didn't give me my rights. They may have agreed with it. They may have agreed with the biblical standard and they may have cooperated, but you know what? Paul lived under a terrible government system and he did pretty good. He got beaten a few times and thrown into prison and eventually killed, but he still did very well. <laughs> and you know what? I may be rejected and beaten and go to prison, but you know what? I'm going to keep loving God and I don't care. The government didn't give me my rights and my joy. God did and I'm going to keep loving God. I don't care what happened. <laughs> Amen. So I'm not condemning anybody. I understand that all of us have problems and go through things, but I tell you, I'm just not going to keep lowering the standard so that just feel good about being miserable. Feel good about being depressed. Feel good about being poor. Feel good about it. We don't want you to feel bad about anything. You ought to feel bad about it. Amen. It says in verse, uh, 
in verse nine, because thou hast made the Lord, which is my refuge, even the most high, thy habitation. Here it is again, emphasizing the same thing that verse one says, you have to dwell in the secret place of the almighty. Now, because you have made the Lord your habitation, the word habitation means a place where you dwell, a place where you live. Not some place that you go vacation once a year. This is where you live. This is your normal thing. Because of that, that's why all of these blessings are coming. It says in verse 10, there shall no evil befall thee, neither shall any plague come nigh thy dwelling. I believe that that is available to every one of us. I believe that you can live a life that you defy just physical, natural things. And that you live under a supernatural blessing. I'm sure many of you have heard about John G. Lake. Who saw so many people healed. That they actually gave him a medical license. He didn't have any medical training. But he had so many people healed. That in Spokane, Washington. They had two hospitals at the time. One of them closed down. Because of a lack of business. It was Spokane was voted the healthiest city in America. For generations because of the ministry of John G. Lake. And one time they had some kind of a plague and they were using a high school gymnasium for treating all of the people. And because he had this medical license or whatever, he was in there helping the medical professionals and they saw a person convulse, foam at the mouth and die. And, and the medical guy said to John Lake, says, man, aren't you glad that we've got a vaccination against this? And John Lake said, who's got a vaccination? And this medical guy just panicked like, you can't be working with these people without a vaccination. You'll die. And he just freaked out over it. And John Lake says, no plague can touch my body and live. No germ can touch my body and live. That's the same thing that this is saying. This is where he got it from. And of course, this medical person didn't believe it and mocked him over it. And so he says, I'll prove it to you. And he had him take one of those slides that you put under a microscope and they wipe some of the saliva off of this person's face that had just died and they put it under the microscope and you could see all of those germs just moving. And then he says, watch this. And he just touched that, that spit with his finger. And the moment he did, everything was dead. It just stopped moving. And he walked in supernatural health. And I know somebody, well, I just don't believe that you should be preaching that. Well, <laughs> shame you didn't tell God that. He wrote it in his Bible. I'm just telling you what the Bible says. <laughs> but the sad fact is most people don't let the Bible get in the way of what they believe. <laughs> I don't care what the Bible says. I just don't believe that. Well, then it won't work for you. <laughs> Amen. Praise God. For he shall give his angels charge over thee to keep thee in all thy ways. You know, the devil quoted verses 11 and 12 to Jesus when he took him up to the pinnacle of the temple. But he took away part of verse 11 and added to part of verse 12 to change the meaning. Here's the way that the devil quoted this. He says, for he shall give his angels charge over thee, period. He didn't mention that to keep you in all of your ways. In other words, if you are walking in the revelation and in the truth that God has given you, if you are dwelling in the, under the shadow of the almighty, then there's supernatural protection. But you go out here and rob a bank and do something and, and wave a gun at somebody, you can get shot and killed and then say, well, Psalms 91 didn't work. You weren't a dwelling in the secret place of the almighty. That wasn't your habitation. You weren't walking in the ways that God had for you. And so it's important that you have to say that he will give his angels charge over thee to keep thee in all of thy ways. You know, I really firmly believe with all of my heart that God is leading me to do what I'm doing. I really do. I believe that if the Lord tarries, this is going to be an awesome move of God that is going to affect not only this nation, but multiple nations. And in order to do what God's told me to do, I believe he's led me to do what I'm doing. Amen. And so I believe 
that he's going to keep me in all of my ways, that his angels are over me. But I guarantee you, if this was just my own dream, if I'm out building my kingdom, if I'm doing this for ego things so that I could have a legacy and stuff, man, I'm in big, big trouble because God is under no obligation whatsoever to help me get this done. And I know that there's probably some of you here that probably think that's true. But you know what? I look back at this. When we started this process in 2009, we had zero. We were paying our bills, but I mean, we had zero money for construction. We've now spent over $42 million in the last, we didn't actually start spending money until 2010, I think it was. And it was 2012 when we broke ground on this and actually started spending. And during that time, for 30 something months, we have spent over $40 million and I didn't have a thing. To me, it's a testimony that this isn't my own deal. I'm walking in the ways that God has given me. And because of that, there's supernatural provision. But if God tells you to go do something over here, and you say, I don't want to do that. I think this is a better idea. And you go do that. You aren't going to see the supernatural provision of God. Not because God's against you, but God is, is not going to fund your Ishmael. You go out and have an Ishmael, you're going to have to feed him. Amen. It'd be better just to stick with Isaac. So there shall no evil befall thee, neither shall any plague come nigh thy dwelling. He will give his angels charge over thee to keep thee in all thy ways. That's important. And then in verse 12, they shall bear thee up in their hands, lest thou dash thy foot against a stone. Satan added to that over in Matthew 4 and in Luke chapter 4. Satan added, lest thou at any time dash thy foot against a stone. He changed the meaning of it. God said he'd give his angels charge over thee, but you've got to be... Uh, cooperating, dwelling in the presence of the Almighty and stuff. It didn't say under at any time, under any circumstances, regardless of what you do. Go out there and rob a bank and you'll still be blessed. No. Amen. This is so obvious. It seems like people ought to know it. But again, it's just amazing how people don't believe in this. They just, and they get upset. Well, why didn't this work? Well, was it God that told you to do it? Were you doing what God led you to do or were you out doing your own thing? Maybe the reason it's not working is because you're just doing your own thing. You know, this is one of the reasons that I've decided not to borrow any money to do all of this stuff. Because you can do things in the flesh if you start doing that. And I just don't want to do it in the flesh. It's either going to be God, we'll get it done debt free, or I just won't get it done. If, it's, uh, if that's a monument to my ego, well, then it's good that it just sits there and keeps me reminded the rest of my life that this is, this is what you do. Amen. And so it says, thou shalt tread upon the lion and the adder, the young lion and the dragon shalt thou trample under feet. I believe that that's talking about Satan, his forces, because he has set his love upon me. See, here again is the same point being made because you have set your love upon him. In other words, not because you just, you know, wanted a little blessing. You visited there. You, you gave a token commitment to the Lord. You sought him to a degree. No, this is talking about a person. That word set is the exact same word. Over in uh, 2 Chronicles chapter 12, verse 14, where it says Rehoboam did evil because he prepared not his heart to seek the Lord. That word prepared there is, it was translated set and fixed and established. It's the same word. This is talking about a person who has prepared their heart, who has spent time and effort, who is seeking God with their whole heart. These are the people that reap all of these benefits. It says, because thou hast set his love upon me, therefore will I deliver him. I will set him on high because he hath known my name. He shall call upon me and I will answer him and I will be with him in trouble. I will deliver him and honor him with long life. Will I satisfy him and show him my salvation? Man, these are awesome promises that promise victory. And yet, because it doesn't work that often, 
people rather than sitting there saying, maybe I haven't met the conditions. Maybe I'm not dwelling in the presence of the Lord. Maybe I'm not seeking God. It's easier just to say, no, God didn't mean what he says. This doesn't work for everybody. I believe it'll work for anybody who works it. And there's a danger by me even emphasizing this. Some people are going to say, so you aren't preaching grace. Man, it's totally grace. I don't deserve any of these things. And even if I seek God with my whole heart, I still don't deserve it. I still come short of it. But I guarantee you for me to just turn and walk my own way and do my own thing and expect for all of the blessings of God and things to manifest when I am doing my dead level best to go against everything he's leading me to do. I don't live that way. I've got a lot of other things I'm going to share. I'm not probably going to get to it tonight. But over in John chapter 15, Jesus talked about abiding in me and my word abiding in you. If you do that, then you can ask and it shall be done unto you. And, and again, it's conditional. We need to abide in him. This doesn't mean that you're sinless. All of us make mistakes. All of us do things that are wrong. All of us fall short. But when you do it, if you're living and abiding in the presence of the Lord, you'll be quick to say, God, I'm sorry. Thank you for your mercy and forgiveness. And you don't have to leave the presence of the Lord just because you didn't do everything perfectly. But I'm talking about you need to be seeking God. God needs to be first in your life. Boy, look at this verse over in Psalms chapter 10. You ought to read this out of your Bible or some of you wouldn't believe this is in the Bible. You need to turn over and read this on your own. In Psalms chapter 10, in verse one, it says, why standest thou far off, O Lord? Why hidest thou thyself in times of trouble? The wicked in his pride doth persecute the poor. Let them be taken in the devices that they have imagined. For the wicked boasteth of his heart's desire and blesseth the covetousness whom the Lord abhorreth. The wicked through the pride of his countenance will not seek after God. God is not in all his thoughts. That's some radical statement right there. It says a wicked person doesn't have God in all of his thoughts. I think you can turn this around and say it's wicked not to have God in all of your thoughts. And again, please don't misunderstand what I'm saying. I'm not trying to put a burden on anybody, but I'm saying how many of us do things that God's the furthest thing from your mind? You know, I had a friend of mine who wound up committing adultery with up to, he was a pastor of a church and he wound up committing adultery with up to two and three prostitutes a day. And he was going to kill himself and finally he repented and uh, a friend of mine started restoring him and I became good friends with him and we did a lot of things together. He taught here in this school and things like that. And he helped me restore a number of pastors who had had sexual sins and stuff. And one day I was just talking to him and I said, I just don't understand. I don't understand. This guy had seen blind eyes open, deaf ears open. He had seen crutches taken away from people, wheelchairs. They had a whole room full of all of these things and they had seen great miracles. And I said, I just do not understand how a person that has had the relationship with God that you do have had had. I don't understand how you go in and have sex with two and three prostitutes a day. I said, I can't even conceive it. And I wasn't critical of him. It wasn't me preaching at him or condemning him. I was just trying to figure out what's going on so that I could minister to people. I said, how do you do that? And he was just kind of him hawing around. And I said, I, I, if I even try and imagine doing that, the first thing that would come to mind is what's Jesus going to say about this? How does the Lord feel about me having sex with this prostitute? And I said, I couldn't, I couldn't do it because I'd be thinking about, Lord, how is this affecting you? And he said something to me right then that was really revealing to me. And he said, Andrew, he says, when I got into that thing, I had to put God totally out of my mind. He says, if I one time would have had the thought about, Lord, what are you thinking about this? Jesus, is this what you want me to do? He says, I couldn't have gone through with it. 
He says, I literally just got into a state where it was all hormones. It was all emotions. It's like I had blinders on and I never gave God a thought until after it was over. And then all of this stuff would happen. And that says volumes. And you know what? There's a lot of people that they can sit down and watch television shows. They can read books. They can do things that are so ungodly that I guarantee you, you know, Jesus wouldn't be watching that show if he was sitting there with you. And yet you watch it. And you can just turn your spiritual life on and off. And you can, you just have large segments of your life that, hey, this, this is what I do. And God loves you. God's not mad at you. God's not condemning you. I'm not condemning you. But I'm telling you, that's one reason that you aren't seeing the power of God manifest more is because you aren't dwelling in the presence of God. And you are allowing all kinds of things to happen and go through you that shouldn't be going through you. A wicked person doesn't keep God in all of his thoughts. If you don't keep God in all of your thoughts, that doesn't mean you're wicked, but it means that is a wicked thing to do. That's the way that the wicked, the ungodly live. I believe that this is one reason that the ungodly don't like to have anything about the Lord spoken around them. Because they just, they have to push that out of their mind. If they were to sit down and think about what they're doing and what the word of God says. And if they were to submit to any standard of morality, they could not live the way that they do. And yet they are committed to living a certain lifestyle. And in order to do it, they have to silence anything that reminds them of God. That's what's going on. You know, if a person wants to be a homosexual, let them be a homosexual. Why do they have to have a parade and brag about it and force me to promote it? It's because they don't want God in their thoughts. They don't want anybody standing up and saying this is right and wrong. It doesn't matter how much love I say it with. It doesn't matter what's going on. They just don't want to hear it. They hate God. They hate the thoughts of God and they don't want that. And sad to say, brothers and sisters, there's many of us that just have large segments of our life where God doesn't have anything to do with it. You know, we've heard this example before about there's certain parts of your heart that are like rooms in a house and you keep that one locked. You don't let the Lord go there. There's Christians that love God and in certain areas of their life, they will seek God, but yet they're just, they're addicted to pornography or whatever. And it's, it's inequitable. And you know why stuff like that can happen? Because you can go and you let areas of your life where you don't dwell in the presence of God. You go in and out. You just stay there for brief periods of time. You don't live in the presence of God. I don't know how many of you remember this book that was written when I was a kid. I read this book about In His Steps. And it was about a Presbyterian minister that had a, a bum come to his house and try and beg some food. And he just kicked him out and said, I hadn't got time for you and sent him off. And it turned out that this bum had been to nearly every house in the uh, church. And on Sunday, he showed up at the church and he was dirty and filthy and they didn't want him around and they kind of pushed him to the side. And anyway, he wound up dying in that church service. And this is a true story. This really happened. And so he died in the church service and the pastor realized that here was a person who was physically starving to death and he didn't help him and he got convicted. And so he called the church together and he told them, he says, you know, we didn't respond to this man the way that Jesus would. And he says, I'm sorry. And he says, I'm just going to make a commitment that I'm going to ask, what would Jesus do? You know, this had a resurgence a few years back where they had the bracelets that WWDJ or what was that? WWJD, that's a, WWDJ is a television station, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> but WWJD, and uh, what would Jesus do? He asked that question and he says, I'm making a pact. And in everything I do, I'm gonna sit here and say, what would Jesus do? And it's, it's just another way of approaching this same subject. 
of a, am I going to dwell in the presence of God? Am I going to live my life, not just on Sunday or during a devotion or during certain times of the day, but am I going to live my life the way that Jesus wants me to? Am I going to live in the presence of God? And he made that pact. And the rest of the book talked about how it just revolutionized that church and that community. I mean, there were people that ran the newspaper and they were putting stories in there and running ads that they, after they prayed about it, they said, Jesus wouldn't promote this. Jesus wouldn't advertise this. And they stopped. And at first it looked like their paper was going to go under because they lost those revenues. And yet the Lord prospered them. They did better. Things changed. People began to start making these decisions in every sing single situation that they had. And I guarantee it caused an absolute revival. If that same thing was to happen to us, if we were to just say, I'm going to dwell in the secret place. I want all of these benefits, but I've been trying to get them without doing what the scripture says. It, the Lord isn't my habitation. My love isn't set, focused, fixed on him, established. And yet I'm still wanting all of these things without being committed to him. If you would make the decision and just commit your life to God, that God, I want to serve you above anything and everything else. There's not an area of my life that I'm going to indulge. I will ask you, does this, the way I dress, does it please you? Does the way I talk please you? Is the way I'm dealing with my neighbors pleasing you? And you just dwell in the presence of God so that you don't have a segment of your life that is outside of his reach. It would transform your life. It would totally transform your life. I've already mentioned this, but Isaiah chapter 26, verse three says the Lord will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed upon him because he trusts in him. And I tell you, if you aren't having perfect peace, if you're worried, if you're anxious, if you're stressed out, you can say what you will, but it's because your mind isn't stayed on him. And again, I'm not a perfect example on this. I'm not trying to present myself that way, but I'm telling you, I have a supernatural peace. It's amazing how things don't ruffle me the way that it does other people. And I, a large part of it is because to the best of my ability, man, I can't try and keep my mind stayed on God all of the time. It's not just part of the time. It's not a devotional life. There aren't times that I can go in and pray and then I'm just in the presence of the Lord and walk out of there and be as mean as a snake and act like I had never been around God. Amen. Any of you ever read a book about practicing the presence of the Lord by brother, what was his name? Brother Lawrence. Well, that's a great book. And it talks about this same thing. And he, he said that he had gotten to a place that Washing the dishes. He hated working in the kitchen. And for 20 years, his job was working in the kitchen. And he got to where working in the kitchen and washing dishes was as much devotion. And he felt as much joy and peace doing that as he did when he was going through all of his holy rituals and doing those things. That's the way that God wants us to live. Amen. He wants us to dwell in the presence of the Lord. Let me just read some verses real quickly. I'll, I'm winding down. But over here in John chapter 15, here's what Jesus said. He said, I am the true vine and my father is the husbandman. Every branch in me that beareth not fruit, he taketh away. And every branch that beareth fruit, he purgeth it that it may bring forth more fruit. Now you are clean through the word which I have spoken unto you. Abide in me and I in you as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself except it abide in the vine. No more can ye except ye abide in me. I am the vine. You are the branches. He that abideth in me and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. For without me, you can do nothing. If a man abide not in me, he is cast forth as a branch. Notice it didn't say that God cast him forth as a branch. It just says that you'll be cast forth as a branch. In other words, if you don't depend upon the Lord and let God be your strength, you can do things your own, but you'll wind up being cast aside and man will gather you and cast you into the fire and you'll be burned. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, you shall ask what you will and it shall be done unto you. And these are powerful scriptures 
And Jesus is comparing us to a vine, to a branch in a vine. And in the same way that you can't separate a branch from the vine. And you also can't take a branch and just for one hour a day, plug it into the vine and see it bear fruit. It's going to have to stay there. It's going to have to live there. It's going to have to be inseparably attached to that vine to be able to produce fruit. And yet somehow or another, Christianity has been reduced down to a Sunday only or to a devotion time or something like that. And then the rest of the time, we do pretty much what we please. Amen. Amen. Jesus is saying that we have to abide in him and have his words abide in us. And then when we're abiding in him and he's abiding in us, he's always abiding in us. But are you abiding in him? And when you do that is when you ask and whatsoever you ask, it'll be done unto you. Man, these are really simple things that I'm saying. I know it's not complicated. But again, I say, how many of us are dwelling in the secret place of the most high? And I'd have to say that probably the majority of us don't live there. We visit there. And then we wonder why we aren't seeing the results. Again, this is not saying that you've got to be perfect, but it is saying that your heart needs to be soft and pliable to God. You need to be seeking after God instead of doing your own thing. You need to be committed to God. Amen. And I really believe that this week, God has given me a lot of things to share about dwelling in his presence. The first thing I'm trying to do is just to show you that this really isn't an option. This is the normal Christian life. And then I'll give some practical steps about how do you do it and about understanding that God is a good God and God's not mad at you and God's not punishing you and he's not against you. And there's going to be a lot of edifying things that I do. But the first thing is just to say that brothers and sisters, we are living so far below the standard that God has for us. And then we wonder why it is that we aren't seeing all of these things come to pass. It's not God's fault. God's faithful. God is faithful. He wants to release all of these things that I've talked about tonight. This is God's will for every single person in here. But there's things that we have to do to cooperate with God. Again, let me use myself as an example. I haven't done everything right. I don't expect that I will do everything right. If this building gets slowed down, stopped or whatever, you know what? It's no criticism of God. It'd be a criticism of me. Amen. But God's not mad at me. I don't care if I mess up. I don't care if I do something wrong. God still loves me. And I'm going to still dwell in his presence. And I'm still going to receive his. If I wound up realizing God... I totally missed you. This is not you. I just need to repent and quit. You know what? God had loved me just the same as if I'd done everything perfectly. I am not preaching that God's love or anything else is upon me being perfect. But I am saying that I have to cooperate. And you know what? If I hadn't cooperated with God, if God would have told me to do this, and if I'd have showed him my balance sheet and said, God, we do not have enough money. You're wrong. I'm not going to do this. And if I'd have never taken a step of faith, if I'd have never taken the limits off of God, and if I hadn't have started believing bigger, and if I hadn't have started speaking my faith, I hadn't got time to teach on all of that. But remember I said that all of these things are voice activated. And back in 2002, the Lord, one of the things he told me was that I was afraid of what people said. And because of it, I wasn't speaking my vision. And it was an important part. I had to start speaking my vision. I had to say what I believe God put in my heart. And if I hadn't have cooperated with God and have taken some steps and have taken some criticism and some flack and run a potential risk, you would not be sitting in this building right now. You wouldn't be seeing that building go up and you hide and watch. We will get that done. And someday you can come back and sit in that building and stuff. But it, you know, none of this would have happened without me cooperating. So does that mean, does that mean that I made this happen? Boy, look at the house that Andrew built. Man, that's just stupid. I did not do this. It's God that did it, but God flows through people. You do have to cooperate with God. There is a part that we have to play. I didn't earn this. I don't deserve it. 
Man, I look at what God is doing in my life and the, you know, seeing people from all over the world here. And I'm thinking, God, this is just so awesome. It humbles me. It doesn't make me operate in pride. It humbles me to see that God has used me to touch people all over the world. You've heard me say, my mother pointed her finger and says, you aren't smart enough to do this. And it's absolutely true. I don't take any credit for this. I didn't do it. I don't deserve it. I'm not worthy of it. I hadn't earned it, but I did cooperate. I had a part to play. There was a part on my part. And that's all I'm saying. There's a part on your part. And it's dwelling in the secret place of the most high. Dwelling in his presence. Not having a spiritual life and then a carnal life. A secular life and a spiritual life. You just need to get to where you dwell in the presence of the Almighty. You don't leave. And if we would do that, brothers and sisters, I guarantee you, it would transform everything. When you keep your mind stayed on the Lord, you'd have perfect peace. You would have a different opinion about things. Everything in your life would be totally different if we were to just dominate ourselves with focusing on the Lord and his presence and his goodness for us and things like that. It's that simple. It's not easy. The hardest thing you'll ever do is get to where you just stay focused on God. This world will draw you like a magnet. All of the things that we've embraced and that we now associate with all of these great feelings, all of the ungodly things that the world does that we participate in and stuff. It'll, it's not the easiest thing to overcome, but it's as simple as what I'm talking about. You dwell in the presence of the Almighty and all of these benefits will come upon you. Amen? Amen. And let me say this. I want to give an invitation and ask this, that if you do not have the baptism of the Holy Spirit, I believe it's impossible for you to dwell in the presence of the Almighty. I just think it's impossible. That's based on my own personal testimony as well. I could show you many, many, many scriptures, but the Holy Spirit, it says four or five times in John 14, 15, and 16 that the purpose of God sending the Holy Spirit was to glorify Jesus and to lift him up, to keep him in your focus. That's the ministry of the Holy Spirit is to constantly just point you towards Jesus. And if you don't have the baptism of the Holy Spirit, I believe it's impossible for you in the flesh, in your own human nature, to keep just stayed on God and live in the presence of God. You need the supernatural, empowering presence of the Holy Spirit. When I received the Holy Spirit, I guarantee you one of the very first things that happened was that everything but Jesus lost its appeal in my life. And I was just absolutely consumed with Jesus. I've never gotten over it, never intend to. And I'm telling you, if you don't have the baptism of the Holy Spirit, which includes speaking in tongue, it's not only that, but that's one of the things, that's one of the gifts that the Holy Spirit gives everybody. You may not have a gift of tongues that operates in a church where you get it interpreted, but he gives all of us the ability to speak in tongues. It says believers will speak with new tongues. So if you don't have that, and if you don't speak with tongues, then it's going to be impossible for you in yourself to be able to dwell in the presence of God. The Holy Spirit was given to constantly be drawing us unto God and revealing him unto us and keeping us in this mindset. And so you need the baptism of the Holy Spirit. You know, it's like a person standing in a mud puddle in the flesh. All you can do is clean one leg. But then to get the other one clean... You're going to have to put that one back down and clean, and then you're going to be back in this mess. And that's the way it is when you are trying to overcome the flesh with the flesh. You just can't do it. You need somebody to lift you out of this. You need something bigger and better than you. And I'm telling you that the baptism of the Holy Spirit is absolutely essential to be able to glorify Jesus and to draw you unto him and to put things in and to live what I was talking about here tonight. So if there's anybody here that doesn't have the baptism of the Holy Spirit and speak in tongues, man, we would love to help you receive that and help you to receive that here tonight. Also, if you don't know Jesus personally, you have to first of all receive Jesus as your personal savior before you can be baptized with the Holy Spirit. So you need 
Jesus and you need the Holy Spirit. I'm assuming that the majority of people here have made Jesus your savior and you've received salvation. But I know in a crowd this many that there's people here that have not received the Holy Spirit. And it would be just absolutely wrong on my part to put this goal there and then not give you the stuff that it takes to be able to reach it. And I'm telling you, you cannot dwell in the secret place of the Most High without the presence and the power of the ministry of the Holy Spirit in your life. So is there anybody here tonight who would just say, man, I need that. I'm ready. Would you please pray for me and help me to receive? If that's you, I want you.